So in part two of the novel, we also learn uh, the tragic fate of Harris. Um, and we learn more about Robert's close bonding uh, with Harris. That seems to, I don't know, it, you, it depends on how you read it, but um, whether or not this was sort of more than a friendship uh, in the novel, whether Robert was in love with uh, Harris, uh, you could read it that way, and it's been read that way um, by other critics, but uh, we'll look at some of the passages where this relationship is depicted. Uh, so on page 91, um, Robert is in the dugout and he's listening to Poole breathing and it reminds him of Harris. Uh, so it uh, describes, it reminded Robert of Harris and that was the last thing he needed reminding of. All he wanted was a dream, escape, but nobody dreams on a battlefield. There isn't any sleep that long. Dreams and distance are the same. If he could run away like Longboat, put on his canvas shoes and the old frayed shirt and tie the cardigan around his waist and take off over the prairie. But he kept running into Taffler, throwing stones and Harris. So and we have some, uh, the sort of Im implication of Robert's daydreaming. You know, he's caught in this moment between sleep and dreaming and um, he's having a hard time falling asleep while he's in the dugout for obvious reasons, and um, he thinks about Harris, and this is something he doesn't really want to think about, but it comes and pops into his head, and he also uh, imagines running away into the distance, so his previous life when he was free and uh, running on the prairies, and then meeting Taffler. So Taffler and Harris are kind of conflated in his mind as well, uh, this could be an indication of his sort of homoerotic desires for uh, Harris, an attraction to Taffler, possibly, uh, or it could just be a reminder of things that he, you know, experienced in the past, and they are distracting him from the reality of what um, he is currently living. Um, it sort of reminds me of, you know, the things they carried, which we read uh, earlier in the term, um, but those ideas and dreams and memories of a past life sort of pop up into your mind of the soldiers who are, you know, stuck in horrible uh, situations. Um, so Robert is thinking about Harris, and uh, prior to being on the battlefield, he had this instance where he was visiting Harris, and he Harris actually um, died in the hospital, and Robert was there during his last days. He was the only close friend who came to visit Harris. Um, so Harris didn't get better after he was um, taken from the uh, ocean liner that brought them over. So his sickness just increased. And uh, Robert was by his side throughout uh, Robert's or Harris's last days. And then there's some interesting sort of conversations that Robert has with Harris. And he seems to remind Robert a little bit of Rowena in the sense that both Harris and Rowena are kind of fragile type people. Uh, Robert looks after both of them uh, while they are sort of sickly and fragile. And then on the page of 90, top of 93, we get an indication of, you know, perhaps Robert had more feelings than he would, you know, likely admit to uh, for Harris. These two men were bonded together. Um, so Robert watched for hours while Harris fought for breath. The hours were made worthwhile whenever Harris woke and smiled, and sometimes Robert had to look away because he was confused by what he felt. The thing was, no one since Rowena had made Robert feel he wanted to be with them all the time. So this is, you know, implying that Robert and Harris shared a kind of uh, bond that went beyond just friendship. Um, Robert maybe was in love with Harris, or... Again, it's hard to say uh, or sort of in, infer too much into uh, what Finley is saying. Um, it can be read that way. Uh, but I think there's the indication that, you know, again, when you're stuck in a situation where life and death, uh, you bond with people, and it's sort of beyond um, rational explanation as well. So he bonds with Harris, and uh, they become uh, 
very intimate and personal, and they have these conversations. And then he says, Harris said the strangest things. And Harris, as it turns out, is somewhat of a sort of storyteller or poet type. And he talks about his childhood and all these instances. And there's a lot of sort of strange, almost dreamlike uh, descriptions of Harris's dreams um, and his memories of swimming. So Harris, like Rowena, in fact, is also uh, connected uh, with uh, sea life. Well, Rowena was connected with rabbits, um, but she was also a hydrocephalic, or her uh, her condition was the fact that she had water in the brain, is sort of how it translates to. Um, so perhaps they are aligned in that way as well, because Harris also talks about water a lot. And he talks about swimming with the sea life. And then there's the description of being swimming with, alongside the seal. Uh, so he said there, or alongside the fish. And he says, then I'd slide like a seal out of the air and into the water, out of my world into theirs. And I'd stay there for hours or so it seemed. I would think I'd never have to breathe again. I've changed. It changes you. But the thing was, I could do it, change and be one of them. They aren't any friendlier, the fish, you know, but they accept you there as if you might belong if you wanted to. It's not like here. It's not like here at all. So, again, you could interpret that in a lot of different ways, but perhaps there is some indication of, you know, maybe Harris is talking about his own um, identity as somebody who doesn't quite fit in or doesn't quite belong in uh, the world where he lives. Um, maybe he feels ostracized or excluded. Um, perhaps he, like Robert, uh, also, you know, ident doesn't identify with the the gender roles that are uh, dominant at the time, um, and he describes feeling like he belongs in the ocean while he is swimming with the fish. And this is also developed uh, later. These same sort of poetic images. Um, when it's described uh, how Harris eventually uh, dies and Robert was with him during his last days. Um, so page 103, uh, he talks about Harris as, you know, if not a poet, certainly a storyteller, and he would tell uh, Robert of all these um, tales related to the sea and animals, whales, and then he has this interesting philosophy of life. So he tells Robert uh, near the bottom of 103, we were always men. He didn't believe all that stuff about fish and frogs. Oh, this is Robert's view of Harris. And then Harris says, uh, everyone who's born has come from the sea. Your mother's womb is just the sea and small. The birds come out of the sea and eggs. Horses lie in the sea before they're born. The placenta is the sea and your blood is the sea. Continued in your veins. We are the ocean walking on the land. So definitely a kind of poetic um, sentiment, uh, the way that Harris talks about all life. It's kind of interconnected, everything, uh, men, humanity is connected to animals, is connected to the natural world. Um, so he sort of sees everything as sort of interconnected. Um, all living creatures are connected. So it's a sentiment and a sort of philosophy that Harris represents that Robert is really attracted to. Uh, Robert doesn't sort of articulate it in that same way, but he senses that Harris is, um, you know, he maybe is a more abstract thinker than Robert is, more poetic, and uh, but they are connected in this regard. And eventually Harris will die and Robert was with him. Uh, Robert takes Harris's old gloves with the bitten fingers and the long blue scarf, so he takes those with him to the battlefront. And then uh, Robert leaves and then comes back and then Harris has died and been cremated, um, so he wasn't actually there uh, during the death, but um, he ends up uh, seeing Taffler again, Taffler who is now dating Barbara Dorsey, and then both Taffler and Robert and Barbara 
all take uh, the ashes, Harris's ashes, and then Taffler throws them out into uh, the water. And this is how uh, Robert's relationship with Harris ends. Harris has died, and uh, Robert is being sent to the battlefront um, with the, his first sort of experience of a soldier's death. Um, and the ashes on his fingers, so uh, there is sort of some interesting bonding going on between all these uh, characters and uh, Harris and Robert um, are sort of the most closely connected characters uh, in regards to Robert's true self which becomes um, sort of more and more evident as the story goes on. We're also introduced to uh, Lady Barbara D'Orsi, and she is one of the characters uh, of the D'Orsi family uh, that we're introduced to. Um, and in their family, the younger uh, sister, Julia D'Orsi, is the one who is um, being interviewed by our narrator. And she has all these diaries that she wrote when she was a 12-year-old girl. And uh, she talks about Robert Ross and all her memories. Um, and vividly describes uh, her, you know, living in um, St. Albans, which becomes a kind of convalescent home for wounded soldiers, and Robert spends a lot of time there. Uh, but her sister, so Juliet's sister, is Barbara Dorsey, and Barbara Dorsey is the one who dates all the uh, handsome young male soldiers who return from war um, and she just seems to go from one to the next to the next um, and breaks up with them after they have been wounded or are no longer uh, this sort of uh, she can't really put them on a pedestal anymore once they're wounded or um, disabled uh, so she just has these kind of hero worship that she does uh, with her men that she dates and uh, Juliet Dorsey, so her younger sister, is um, one of Robert's uh, sort of most outspoken um, followers. And uh, she supports Robert. She knows him um, more than some of the other characters do. And she believes in what uh, he did was right and that Robert was, um, that we should empathize with Robert. Uh, so she is the one uh, will get her transcribed uh, interviews from the narrator where he interviews Lady Dorsey who's now in her uh, old age and she'll recall the family dynamics of her household and her encounters with Robert and um, she'll read from her diaries uh, that she wrote when she was a 12 year old girl. Um, but I think Ro Kath or, um, Juliet or Barbara Dorsey is uh, also a fascinating character in her relationship to uh, Taffler and Robert. She's sort of in, in the middle of a kind of uh, love triangle. And uh, this first encounter is when uh, Robert, who's visiting Harris, and then he first meets uh, Lady Barbara, Barbara Dorsey, and she's at this point dating uh, Taffler. So Taffler uh, is described on page 94 uh, and it goes back to that image of the glorified soldier. So Taffler was looking more like a boy's own annual hero than ever, dressed in his uniform with his green field tabs, carrying a swagger stick and groomed within an inch of his life. So he looks like, you know, he's on the pedestal, he's the pinnacle of uh, the idealized soldier, hero, and then on his arm is Barbara Dorsey, and she's described as a kind of, um, you know, she would have been a very wealthy kind of socialite type. Um, she would have been photographed and put into the sort of uh, newspapers and stuff like that. So she's sort of a minor celebrity slash socialite uh, living. Um, so somewhat famous just for being sort of from a wealthy, wealthy upper class family and there's some sort of measure of nobility. She's Lady Barbara Dorsey, right? So they come from a kind of upper class uh, family. And then her family will run St. Aubyn's. Uh, her mother 